We thank you for your patience. Thank you for your patience and for your understanding. It's sharp, 7.30. We better get going. As Mrs. Redding is here, we thank you for that. We thank you for your presence, for the readiness to cooperate with this living inquiry session and, of course, for her most valuable time. I understand he's here just for one hour. <coughs> She's here just for one hour. So let's make the best use of it. We are here to attend the presentation by Vice President and Commissioner Reading on the Commission Communications on the European Union, U United States Data Flows, the functioning of U.S. safe harbor, and report of transatlantic group of experts and the state of the play on data protection package. We are to move on, informing us about these data flows adopted by the uh, Commission last November 27, 2013. U.S. safe harbor already been examined by the Libby Committee inquiry during the meeting of 7th of October 2013, in which the committee had the opportunity to hear the testimony of national data protection authorities, European data protection supervisor, and an independent consultant. The impact of the U.S. National Security Agency mass surveillance activities on the safe harbor is also addressed in this working document co-authored by our Rapporteurs, Mr. Foss and Mr. Moraes. So, Vice President Reading, surely you understand that this committee is interested in hearing our state of the play on data protection package after the, we should say, disappointing outcome of the last day Council of December the 6th. Mrs. Redding is also invited to refer to this report of the EU-US Transatlantic Expert Group on Data Protection and Mass Surveillance Activities and will inform us about the next steps to follow. Mrs. Redding, thank you again for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, President, and let me say that I am very much impressed by the work uh, this inquiry committee uh, has been doing since the NSA revelations this summer. Um, you have uh, welcomed an impressive number of speakers, and those are very valuable um, testimonies, both for the Parliament and for the Commission. Um, so I look forward to read all the conclusions uh, that your rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, is preparing. Now, we all know that the Snowden revelations have affected trust in our transatlantic relationships. The Commission immediately took a firm stance, saying clearly that the mass surveillance is unacceptable. And uh, we wrote, we meaning uh, Commissioner Malmström and myself, to our U.S. counterparts, asking a series of questions immediately. And then, in June, we raised the issue at the EU-US Ministerial. And on the basis of this, um, a, number, a number of steps were taken to address our concerns. Uh, in June, the EU-US Ad Hoc Working Group on Data Protection was set up and conducted at different levels with the US authorities, the US Congress and Senate intensified. You have been debriefed regularly about the work of the EU-US Working Group, and we have also had the opportunity to discuss our different contacts with US authorities. I do think that the joint work of the Parliament and the Commission has been very important. I still remember when we were in Washington at the same time, and uh, I bumped into familiar faces in the corridors of uh, the Congress. Um, it was pleasant, of course, but it was efficient because we all gave the same message. And I think it was a real wake-up call uh, for um, senators and uh, members of Congress uh, to hear that we were uh, really serious 
about this uh, and um, they came back from their constituency having heard from uh, their voters that they were not amused either and that made a change. So both the constituencies and uh, the uh, presence of the commissioner and uh, the members of this uh, parliament. Uh, I think we made our concerns and expectations very clear to our US friends and we made sure that the rights of the US citizens were part of the debate in the US, which was not at all the case before, I must say. As we have made progress, the Commission felt the need not only to report to the European uh, Parliament um, by speaking, uh, but also uh, to report more formally, and that is why we issued a communication. Um, in the communication, we set out the challenges and risks following the revelation of the US intelligence collection programs, and we make recommendations on how to address them and restore trust in the EU-US data flows. We have also presented an analysis on the functioning of safe harbor and a report on the findings of the EU-US working group on data protection. Um, we prepared you a file with all these uh, papers so that you can, you can have them um, in a written format. So first, the EU-US <coughs> Working Group. Uh, they were published, um, the findings of this Working Group, on the 27th of November. The group proved to be useful as the US authorities engaged with us on important issues. Now, I have to be very clear here, not all of our questions got a complete answer. And the report is very clear on this. We know little, for instance, about the use of some US uh, legal, data, legal basis on data collection, such as executive orders. We know little on the existence of other surveillance programs, as well as the limitations applicable to those programs. Many questions were answered. They are the raw material, the basis of the recommendations that the Commission has made. And I would like to draw three conclusions from the discussion. First, it has been confirmed that the American programs exist and that their scope is very broad. We had a long discussion about the purpose of those programs and the conditions under which data can be collected and processed under American law. Second, the conditions and safeguards which apply are discriminatory. They protect EU citizens only to a very limited extent. While there are procedures regarding the targeting and minimization of data collection for US citizens, these procedures do not apply to EU citizens even when they have no connection with terrorism, crime or any other unlawful or dangerous activity. In addition, while US citizens benefit from constitutional protections, these do not apply to EU citizens not residing in the US. Third, while some judicial oversight exists, it is of little added value from the perspective of a European, because the orders of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISA, are secret, and companies providing assistance are required to maintain secrecy. There are no avenues, judicial or administrative, for either EU or US data subjects to be informed whether their personal data is being collected or further processed, and there are no opportunities for individuals to obtain access, rectification, erasure of data, or administrative or judicial redress. While there are safeguard oversight mechanisms 
by the three branches of the us government it is clear that they have loopholes and you are aware of the internal us debates on this point by the way. in any case there is no judicial oversight at all on the collection of foreign intelligence outside the us which is conducted under the sole competence of the executive branch. We have shared our concerns on several occasions with the US authorities at the highest level, most recently at the EU-US Justice and Home Affairs Ministerial on the 18th of November in Washington, and I am sure you saw the strong joint press statement that was issued. Attorney General Holder and I had a frank discussion. He recognized that trust in the transatlantic relationship has been negatively affected. I explained what should be done to rebuild this trust and protect the rights of the EU citizens. For the first time, it became clear, not only informally but formally, that the reforms to come in the United States will see not only a link to the rights of the American citizens, but also a link to the rights of the European citizens. These steps are set out in the communication of the 27th of November. Its aim is to define policy objectives through which we would protect the rights of citizens and of businesses in the context of transatlantic data exchanges, and four points stand out. First, we need a swift adoption of the data protection reform, because only if we do have a strong legislative European framework with clear rules that are enforceable also in situations when data is transferred and processed abroad, it would provide the legal certainty and protection for European data subjects and companies which is needed. And I would like to thank your committee, President, because you have done your homework. And I would hope that the um, Council would also do its homework. But you have heard that I was not very diplomatic last week, saying that unfortunately the Council uh, seems to be in deep hibernation and even going a step backwards. Well, I was, uh, I was kind of upset, I must say, and I voiced this very clearly. Uh, uh, I hope that together we can exercise um, the pressure on the Council to accelerate its work. I say clearly that I, I hope that the Greek Presidency, by taking over, uh, will, in other words, continue where the Irish Presidency had stopped in summer. Let's hope that this can be done. Secondly, safe harbor. In one sentence, we must make safe harbor safer. As requested by the European Parliament, we have analyzed the safe harbor regime. And on the basis of the work of the ad hoc group and our discussions with European businesses, we have identified deficiencies, and we have made 13 very concrete recommendations. They relate to all aspects of the scheme, transparency, redress, enforcement, and access for national security purposes, 13 ways to improve the functioning of the same, of safe harbor. Now the authorities which apply the rules of the U.S. side have to deliver. What the U.S. have received is a to-do list, and it is for them to recognize the seriousness of our concerns and to act, 
remedies should be identified by summer two thousand and fourteen on the thirteen points we will then review the functioning of the safe harbour scheme based on the implementation of the thirteen recommendations. Thirdly, we have to agree on strong data protection rules in the law enforcement context. You know what I am speaking about here. The umbrella agreement on data protection in the field of police and judicial cooperation, which I am negotiating since two years. This agreement must guarantee a high level of protection for citizens who should benefit from the same rights on both sides of the Atlantic. Notably, and I come back to what I said already in the beginning, and which became very clear after the analysis of the ad hoc group, EU citizens not resident in the US which do not benefit from judicial redress mechanisms should benefit from those. Now that is the last stumbling block in our negotiations because after these two years we have managed nearly to find an agreement on, on everything. There is nitty gritty to be done. But what is left over and where we did not find any agreement is on the judicial redress mechanisms for European citizens not resident in the United States. We have been told um, always that it was not possible this to be done because the Congress needs to change the law and the Congress doesn't want to change the law. Well, at the EU-US Ministerial, I have received from our US partners a political commitment to address the legitimate concerns of the, US citizen, of the EU citizen for effective redress. These should be similar to those available for US citizens or for persons residing in the US. Um, it is the first time that this opening was made, and this opening was made after <coughs> the uh, meetings the parliamentarians and the commissioner had in the Congress uh, two, ways, two weeks before the ministerial. So this uh, concentrated uh, uh, action which we had launched on the Congress, I think, had some, uh, implement, uh, had, had some results. In addition, the U.S. administration should also commit to, as a general principle, making use of the formal channels of cooperation, because those exist. We do have a, legal, a mutual legal assistant agreement between the United States and the European Union. Just it is not used as it should be used. Uh, it sh in the future, that should be the channel of uh, cooperation um, in order and asking for data held by private companies located in the EU directly, as it is happening now continuously, should only be possible under clearly defined, very exceptional and judicially reviewable situations. And fourthly, and I'm always coming back to the same questions, but these questions have to be solved in different um, uh, instances. So the U.S. reform uh, process, you know that the U.S. Congress is discussing the right balance between security and privacy in surveillance programs, and that the ministerial Attorney General Holder described the concerns among EU citizens and businesses about data protection. A profound debate has started in the U.S. That's completely new because there was no debate in the U.S. before. And to my humble opinion, it was the um, story with the handy of Madame Merkel which launched the real debate in the, um, in, in, in the general uh, public opinion in the United uh, States. So we should nurture this debate and make sure that the concerns of EU citizens are also taken into account. 
that not in the end it is only the concerns of the American citizens because they have started to raise concerns which are taken um, into <coughs> account. And we should also make the case to U.S. business representatives in Brussels because in the U.S. businesses and their interests are very important. Politicians pay attention to them. And businesses have spoken out for more transparency. I see a movement in the direction of ensuring stronger privacy safeguards as without trust of their customers, U.S. companies can lose a lot of revenue and competitiveness. I have written to Attorney General Holder asking the U.S. administration to turn the nice words which were not only said in the, um, in the ministerial but also publicly in a press conference by Attorney General Eric Holder, um, that these words um, should be uh, put into action. So, members of uh, Parliament, since the first story broke, the Commission has been very proactive, it has made its voice heard, it has asked this difficult question, has defended the rights of the citizens, and there now there are ways in which the trust in data flows between the EU and the U.S. can be rebuilt. Now, the past months have shown that when the EU speaks with a single voice, it is heard. So, thank you for that. Thank you for being very proactive. And actually, we have done uh, in October what the Americans are doing all the time. They are coming to our parliament in order to lobby. Now we have been to their parliament in order to lobby and that was the right way to proceed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Which gives us ground to open in the questions and answer sessions. As usual, we're going to first open a round of questions and answers from the rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, and shadow rapporteurs with the order. So please, Mr. Moraes, open up this first round of specific questions to Commissioner Reading, minding the timing all the time, because we must have in mind that uh, Mrs. Reading should be leaving by 8.30. So please have it in mind, all of you. I've got a short list of speakers willing to take the floor. So I, 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 I urge you this time to reframe the best possible to the timing which is scheduled. Mr. Moraes. Okay. That means, uh, Commissioner Redding, I have to dispense with all the thank yous and the, all the crawling. <laughs> so I have to stop all that. Um, but suffice to say that I think um, our delegation, I mean, we didn't, we didn't, um, have formal meetings when you were there and when we were there in October, but we had the same uh, principles in mind. We, we were representing EU citizens and the business community and NGOs, and we, I think, said the same things, built the same relationships with Congress, and I think it was very effective. So that's enough on that question, but I think uh, we could say something about that, but because of time, I think that's enough on that question. Could I... Um, Thank you for coming here and just concentrate perhaps on the work that has to be done, which is really on the data protection package and safe harbour and some of these very difficult issues which are now left for us. First of all, on um, uh, safe harbour. When we were in Washington, we had, a meeting, we had meetings with the uh, Department of Commerce and the Federal Trade Commission. And... Uh, our members raised to the Department of Commerce and the FTC uh, the same concerns that you, you outlined in your 13 recommendations. Now, the Federal Trade Commission admitted that the safe harbour viewed to make the alternative dispute resolution systems free and not subject to the payment of fees uh, and also better ensure that non-compliant companies uh, would be delisted. Um, could I ask you to um, comment on uh, how you feel um, you can enforce the recommendations and how enforceable the, these recommendations are going to be in the light of that. Um, and what steps do you think you can take um, if none of the requirements are going to be met? I mean, I mean just, just a sense of, of that. 
And what is your view on, on the possibility of suspension? My colleague Axel Voss um, has made this a central part of his working document within the working documents we have for the uh, conclusion of our inquiry in uh, February when it goes to plenary. Secondly, on the data protection regulation, which of course Jan Albrecht, has he gone? Where has he gone? Is he still here? Um, he will go into it in more detail. Can I just give the headline on this? Um, of course, it's been delayed. Um, and I just want to ask you what you think about um, what the necessary steps to ensure that, that within this delay and this difficulty with council, how you think the revision of safe harbour is going to be achieved, or at least started in 2014, how you see the strategy, give us some sense of where this is going to go, because we are again faced uh, within this inquiry to make it a credible set of conclusions. Uh, we want to give a sense of direction to uh, the Parliament as to where we're going to go from February onwards, uh, and then into the election and beyond the election. This is quite important to us. So I'm going to leave it there just on these two issues, because I know my colleagues uh, will want to go into more detail on their specific areas. Thank you, Mr. Moraes. Mrs. Redding. Uh, should I answer yes. yes, I mean, um, this is the way we use it here. <laughs> okay. Actually, I mean, the routine we followed is one by one, okay. but if you, if you prefer, in order, in, order, in order to sum up with time, let's go for the shadow rapporteurs, shadow rapporteurs, and then the rest of the members. Okay, then let's go for the shadows. Mr. Foss, you go first. So, ich möchte mich auch recht herzlich bedanken, dass die Kom I'd like to say thank you very much to the Commission for taking this subject of NSA and data protection seriously and going on the offensive. I think that's good, and uh, there needs to be more of it, particularly from the side of the Council. We're all clear about that. But at the moment, it doesn't look like uh, we're going to manage to get that during this Parliament. At the moment, we see the danger for our citizens at two levels. Firstly, through bugging, perhaps illegal bugging by the NSA, and secondly, um, not being bugged but being spied on, and secondly, this deep analysis of the private behaviour of individuals, which uh, then who then have an obligation under U.S. legislation to provide data. So I think it's good that um, the um, convention is being assessed, uh, the recommendations are good, but my conclusion is a rather different one. I can't see that through the recommendations we're going to be able to uh, do much to regain the trust of our citizens. I get the impression we have to take a step further. It's not just a question of suspending something for a, short, for a period. I would say we have to um, renounce it. Trust through the justified um, actions of the Commission will not be reinstated because we don't have control of the whole um, procedure. We are not in a position to protect our citizens more effectively. I would say we have to um, renounce this agreement. We have to go into new negotiations on a shared basis. That's something that is being attempted. But this also, with respect to the fact that um, there has to be legal protection provided for our citizens, and also that uh, we should perhaps be certifying the American companies ourselves, because then we'll have more control. We've got the standards on the basis of which we do things here. We can impose them on them and check they're being complied with. And I think that that will do far more to regain the citizens' trust than leaving things still in the hands of the Department of Commerce, particularly since I don't know, and I'll ask this, I don't know whether the recommendations that are being given um, would uh, be binding in nature and how they could be evaluated and whether they are in fact sufficient. So I would be in favour of um, withdrawing from the Convention, setting it 
up setting up a new version on the basis of proper data protection standards because I do get the impression that we get uh, we won't get this um, loss of trust on the part of the citizens and this uh, deep intervention into their data without doing things that way. Mrs. Sindveld goes first. Mrs. Sindveld. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, for your, uh, your statement uh, and your efforts. Um, I have a few questions, though, um, because it's all very well that we, after the, all the revelations, we uh, entered into dialogue with the Americans. Um, but I, I still have the feeling, and I've said it before, that's asking you know, the, the, the perpetrator to admit that he's done something that he didn't want to admit in the first, in the first place. Um, so I think that we need to rely much more on ourselves than dialogue with people who clearly do not respect our laws. This is not about what the U.S. do to us. This is about getting our own house in order and asking ourselves why it has been possible in the first place that the U.S. have done something like this or are doing something like this to our citizens and indeed other countries as well. Why have we been unable to protect and safeguard the rights and the privacy of our citizens? Now, we will restore the trust, not by talking to the American government, but to, um, to ensure our citizens that they are safe, that we will protect their, their rights. Um, I have a few concrete questions. Um, first of all, we've been talking a lot about the US and, and what they've been up to. I mean, the picture is pretty clear there. But what has the European Commission done about um, the allegations of snooping on citizens by our own EU governments? Uh, because we may not be safe from the Americans, uh, you know, reading our emails and listening into our phone calls, uh, but we're not safe from our own governments either. So what has the Commission done there? What has the Commission done about other governments who clearly intend, I mean, probably all governments want to do it, but some have more means than others. What about the Russian government, which has set up a system called SORM, which has recently been strengthened, which by some media was uh, described as prism on steroids. Um, I've asked the Commission this several times, and no, not you personally, Commissioner, but we've addressed uh, questions to the Commission about this, and, and I've seen preciously little response. I would like to know where everybody's talking about the Olympics now, and the Russians are taking more and more and more measures, um, you know, snooping on their own citizens and on people outside Russia, and they don't seem to care very much. And apparently they don't have to care because nobody is reacting. Um, same incidentally goes for Russians collecting uh, PNR data. I would also like to know why, in, in, against the backdrop of everything, why the European Commission continues to basically sabotage a strong transparency regulation which is the counterweight against government spying on citizens. We need access to information. We need transparency. We need access to documents. Um, I, and, and you know very well that I've got several court cases pending, and I've, I've got a case before the, uh, or several cases before the, uh, the Ombudsman. Why do we have to go at such great length to get access to information which is really not top secret. Because when the documents are finally released, they turn out to be pretty innocent, frankly. Why does the Commission continue to, to block this? What will the Commission do to finally respond to the resolution of this House of two years ago, authored by myself, calling for a thorough evaluation of counter-terrorism policies. Because many of the questions that we are discussing now have been addressed in that resolution. And we asked the Commission and the Council to do a thorough uh, evaluation. So those are the questions uh, that I would like to put to you at this stage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, Mr. Albrecht. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for being here with us and um, summing up the state of the negotiations with the U.S. and also the work in the EU-U.S. Uh, expert group, which I uh, thought a, bit, a little bit that this expert group has not really found very 
many conclusions, uh, so perhaps we have to search for our own conclusions as the European Union, and there you rightly point on our own data protection re reform, and I would like to start with that, asking about uh, the recent negotiations in the Council last week, um, because we as European Parliament really did a quite tremendous effort to get our position voted in October with uh, a large majority uh, here in this House on both sides, the regulation and the directive, with uh, uh, really the effort to get this done before the elections, to give the citizens in the European Union something to uh, be protected in this environment. And I, I'm, really, I'm really disappointed about uh, the negotiations in the Council, and I would like to know about the arguments of those member states who, uh, who had problems finding a, a common solution, a common ground, uh, and especially uh, the position and the arguments of the German minister would be very interesting for me, as I think Angela Merkel pointed out very rightfully already in summer that we need to accelerate the negotiations. Uh, the second question is on the next steps on the safe harbor agreement uh, or the safe harbor declaration uh, because it's, it's in the Commission's hands now to go ahead with drawing consequences on safe harbor. We don't need to agree uh, to have the agreement by the U.S. on it. So uh, I just would like to know once more what exactly are the next steps and what is the timeline somehow for us to look at the uh, process. And I agree with those pointing out, especially Axel Voss, uh, pointing out that we really need now to take our own decisions on it because it's about also the question how to bring it into order with our approach on the market regulation like we would like to do it with the regulation. Um, with the data protection regulation. And the last question is referring to the bilateral agreements of member states vis-à-vis uh, -vis this um, surveillance issues now, because I don't think that this is really uh, an approach which we as the European Union should take now, that we try to get involved bilaterally with the United States. So I would like to know if there will be also somehow forums at least for debate between member states, EU institutions on the question how we approach uh, the relations with the US because if they are always going in parallel negotiated, no, negotiators to Washington doing no spy agreements or whatever agreements, I don't think that this is an appropriate approach of the European Union and uh, perhaps we should debate also about the way how we deal with this uh, I think we work together in foreign uh, relations. The Commission is also competent for foreign relations. We have a coordination when it comes to intelligence. Uh, and so why do we undermine that now with, with national approaches? I, I don't see that this is very helpful. And of course, what Sophie Infeld said on the question, what do we do vis-a-vis -vis our own member state surveillance measures? I think the question still is in the air. Uh, are these measures all covered by the notion of national security? I, I really think we need to scrutinize the scope of national security. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht. The other two shadow rapporteurs are not seeing here, Frau Ernst and, and uh, Mr. Kikov. So we turn back to our Commissioner Redding to respond to the questions that have been made by rapporteur and shadow rapporteurs and then open uh, second round of questions, please try to be concise. Mr. President, um, thank you also for uh, the members uh, who are recognizing that the joint venture in Washington was efficient. It was. Um, safe harbor. Uh, of course, I have uh, seen when I was in the States, FTC and the Department of uh, Commerce, they were not very conscious about what was going on. Uh, they thought it uh, would be a round of talks and that would be. They never expected 
uh, that uh, we would come with a solid review of safe harbour, uh, putting uh, 13 uh, elements of a to-do list uh, on the table. Now, this to-do list uh, goes rather far. Uh, far. Uh, you have the papers, by the way, uh, in your files, so you can look at those. On transparency, because um, many companies, we have the impression, just uh, utilize safe harbor as a uh, um, uh, paravent. How you say that? Um, to, yeah, as a power to, to, yeah, okay, everybody understands what, uh, what I mean. W without really uh, implementing those rules in real term. That means they have the stamp, uh, safe harbor, and that's it. And nobody really controls if behind this stamp there is a certain behavior. There I do understand uh, what uh, the uh, members of parliament say that uh, it might be uh, maybe better if we would do uh, the control rather than um, the uh, Americans um, in, in the FTC. Uh, um, well, uh, on our uh, enforcement uh, uh, recommendations, uh, we, uh, very, we will foresee a greater role of the EU data protection uh, authorities that will give us more uh, control. But, uh, and then on the access by the US authorities on the redress, all this is uh, very clearly uh, defined. You have the papers. I do not need to uh, repeat those. But I have gone rather far. Not everybody likes that, I must tell you. I had really to fight to go as far as I did with the certain uh, recommendations. Now, uh, safe harbor, and I would like to, to say that to Mr. Foss, is not a negotiation between European Union and um, the US. It is a commission decision. It's not an agreement. Huh? So it has not to be negotiated. So these recommendations are a to-do list. They are not uh, a basis for negotiations. We say sine qua non. If you don't do this, then we will come back to our safe harbor decision. Now, you should know also that although, and I have spoken with uh, the uh, European companies, uh, although a number of European companies are very unhappy uh, with the way safe harbor works, because they think it is just not fair that they need to implement the rules and some others don't. Uh, they nevertheless, uh, and that is, an, I would like to say, 95% of the European companies say we need safe harbor, but we need it to work, to be implemented, to be controlled. But to eliminate it would not be a good idea. And that is also the reason why um, to make it work and to control that it is work, that it is implemented. That's exactly what the Commission has now put on the table as a to-do list for our uh, American uh, counterparts. And then we'll have to take a decision. If they don't deliver on this, we will have to take the decision uh, if we continue or not uh, with safe harbor. But the ideal situation would be to continue with a safe harbor which could really uh, be implemented and controlled. Um, for this to really to happen, I do believe that it will be important to have our data protection uh, reform because that gives also much more uh, power on the basis of uh, a common, uh, of one only law for the whole European Union, uh, it, it gives teeth to our data protection authorities. What they can do today, uh, even in the member states where they are stronger than in others? Well, not much, because the sanctions they can give are very low. And I mean, the sanctions are ridiculous. And that is why you said 5% of world, uh, worldwide turnover. I say 2%. Well, that is a question of discussion. But that would give teeth to uh, the data protection authorities in order to implement uh, the rules uh, also. So, you see, 
all these elements are linked one with the other and that is why i was so disappointed if not say uh, uh, more uh, when um, the uh, council was really going uh, a step a step back and tried even the trick uh, to declare after two years of discussion that the legal base would not be the correct one. Uh, fortunately, uh, there was uh, also uh, the uh, Commission uh, Legal Service who took the floor. By the way, it seems it was the first time in history that this happened. Well, it, I made it happen. Um, so, uh, at least this is now um, uh, gone. But Many of the, um, of the ministers took advantage of this in order to say, ah, you see, we need to discuss more. Let's all organize another discussion um, uh, group and, and so on and so forth. Now, I don't want any other discussion um, because uh, we have discussed it top down, left, right, all the time. Um, somebody, uh, we have asked about the German minister. Well, the German minister was not present on Friday, as usual. Eh? Um, he was uh, um, busy with um, uh, doing this, uh, the destruction of the free movement the thing with the British minister of the interior and had no time for data protection. Oh, okay, I, I'm still upset, you understand? Um, because really, uh, and, and I, the, the first six months under the Irish presidency, things have advanced rather well. And last October, on the one-stop shop, there was, we were very near to a, a decision, to a political decision on this one, and then things have gone topsy-turvy and uh, completely uh, backwards. So um, that was very negative, very <coughs> negative, I must say. The positive element is that the Greek minister made it very clear that data protection would be uh, one of his priorities. And so uh, he wants to start already with an informal uh, ministerial uh, in January. Uh, which uh, uh, could help in that uh, respect. But fortunately, we have, uh, man I have managed to block this uh, uh, legal um, basis um, question. Came out of the blue, completely out of the blue. But you see what forces are working in order to, uh, to not to come uh, to a, a conclusion. And you need a, a presidency which wants it, uh, and which is not... Uh, under the influence of um, other forces uh, in order to go ahead with this one. So let's help our uh, Greek um, presidency to, have, uh, a to go ahead on this. Uh, there could be a political agreement in March. It is absolutely possible uh, because things have been discussed in long and in large all of them, all of them. And uh, we do not need unanimity in council. But if you have a presidency which just listens to those minorities which do not want any law for obvious reasons, um, then of course you cannot advance. If you have a presidency which goes with a huge majority in the council, then you can make it. Hmm? So it depends on, on the way a presidency um, acts uh, on this. Uh, I think I, I already answered on... I'm oh, sorry. No, I have not answered on everything. Um, you will have a problem with Madame Dinfeld if I don't answer her, her uh, questions. Not, um, I will not have, but you will have. So I protect you now, uh, President. Um, <laughs> so, according to the treaties, uh, national security falls in principle under the sole responsibility of member states, Article 4 of the treaties. So, we have no competence to monitor the compliance with EU law processing of personal data exclusively carried out for national security 
purposes. However, it follows notably from the case law of the European Court of Justice that national security is not an unqualified and limitless concept. As any derogation, it has to be interpreted strictly and cannot be abused to escape compliance with EU laws. So that is the legal situation. Of course, when I write to the British government on the question of uh, the Tempora uh, programme, and I addressed two letters to the British uh, government, I get a long explanation why what I have just said before and the European Court of Justice case law is not as it is. Hmm? As long as under our treaties member states are in charge of intelligence services, military, their national security, we, the Union's institutions, will be weak and I have always been in favour of a strong unified European voice, including military and intelligence matters. But in some way to go until there, it will be very, very, very uh, difficult. Uh, and we need a political union uh, in order to arrive at that uh, level. On Russia, uh, I, I think I gave you the answer on um, Great Britain, on tempora. Um, on uh, Russia, it is um, more Commissioner Malmström's responsibility, PNR. You have heard what she says on PNR. Well, that is her responsibility. I did not go to the same way on Safe Harbor. Um, but I will certainly also not go to Sochi. So, uh, because there, there are not only the problems of data protection, there are also many problems of um, minorities and, and so on and so uh, for um, the relations between Russia uh, uh, in the hands uh, of um, the high representative also, don't forget that. So I think that I gave the answers to uh, our rapporteur. Um, uh, unfortunately, on the, 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 the answer on the bilaterals, on the no spy agreements and whatever, it, it goes with the answer which I gave uh, before. And we, we will be in a very big conflict with member states uh, who do not recognize uh, the case law of the European uh, Court of Justice. And it will be for the Commission on, 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 on this question extraordinarily difficult to go to court and to win in front of uh, Court. That makes the whole um, inner se in internal security, national security uh, questions uh, difficult to handle. Thank you, Mrs. Reding. You've done our best as usual. Believe me, to many of us, the more we get to know about you, the more we appreciate your refined political perception. <laughs> so it's about time that we proceed to the second round. And uh, I urge, I got a list of at least seven members I see to stick to one minute and a half so that Mrs. Redding can make it in time to provide answers. Please try to make real short, specific questions. We'll get started by Mr. Picker. Herr Picker, seine Welt. Thank you, Herr Vorsitzender. Auch herzlichen Dank, Herr. Thank you, Chairman. I would also like to thank Vivian Redding for her endeavours. I do think you have actually managed to change some aspects of relations. And I know that some American companies, Mark Zuckerberg to mention just one, uh, have made it clear that they find what the US has been doing unacceptable. However, as far as it comes to practical steps which can be taken in terms of this agreement, I think that Europe is still very vulnerable and we have to try to do something proactive. So a couple of suggestions. I'd like to know to what extent the Commission would agree with this and can support it. First of all, the problem is that we seem to be setting up our alarms once the burglars have made it into the house. 
our technology in the European Union isn't up to the same standards as that which seems to prevail in other states, including the United States. So this is why I think it's so important to recognize that US law has made it possible for them just to suck up all this information. We have no control over that. Our target, our objective must be to ensure that we support the European IT industry, and I think the Commission should lead in this. So I think we really should considerably step up investment so as to ensure that we have our own players in this area. We have to ensure that we have our own reserve. The, the speaker has to speak into his microphone. The interpreters can't work with a microphone in this position. I'm sorry. Does beer den Wirtschaftsstandort Europa zu schützen haben? Wir sind Please ask the speaker to put his microphone up and speak into it. Suchen gemäß sorry. Does Thank you very much. We all know that security services are clearly part of national powers or competencies. What we need is some kind of Europol-like organization whose task would be to fight a counter espionage operations with a view to presenting our industry, our research institutes and all the rest of it against attacks and interventions from outside, either the US or the Russians or anybody else. The, inter the speaker is touching his microphone again. This, me this means that anything has to be done on a multilateral basis under the control of the member states. This is the suggestion I'd like to make to the Commission as a transitional phase, if you like, before taking this up to the fully European level. Seven, seven members willing to make points. If all of them use three minutes, it'll be 21. And then Mrs. Redding to respond, please try to, try to help us. Please try to stick to one minute and a half. Senora Romero Lopez. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mrs. Redding, for having joined us today. You told us in your comments that the framework agreement of cooperation in the police and judicial area isn't being used or implemented for the time being. I, I find this surprising. When this agreement was first adopted, we knew that police and judicial systems differed enormously on the two sides of the Atlantic. And I think it was predictable that something along the lines of what's happened could actually happen. So given the fact that we have police and judicial systems are so fundamentally different, and the American state has in effect created this umbrella to protect them from things which we deem to be um, illegal, so the fact is, our agreement with them, our cooperation is now obsolete. And I would be grateful if you could tell us what we can do now. This was supposed to be a framework agreement encompassing a whole series of safeguards preventing just the things which we've been talking about happening. It's yours, one minute and a half. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Redding, um, in the... Um, in the communication on rebuilding trust in transatlantic data flows. Um, you, you talk about how um, the negotiations on the uh, law enforcement data protection agreement provide an opportunity to clarify that personal data held by companies um, located in the EU will be accessed um, will not be accessed outside formal channels such as the MLA or the sectoral agreements except in exceptional defined situations. And then later you say commitments should be sought from the US administration along those lines. How close are you to, sorry I'm doing the same thing, uh, how close are you actually to getting such commitments? Because I noticed that the joint press statement of the 18th of November says there were also discussions on the need to clarify that personal data held by private entities in the territory of the other party will not be accessed by law enforcement agencies outside of legally authorized channels. Now that can be 
in this case, for instance, US legally authorized channels, not agreed uh, legal channels. So it sounds as if there is still a very large gap there. Am I correct? Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Gomez. Commissioner, uh, Vice President, thank you for your uh, somber uh, outlook which we share. Uh, since safe harbor is a decision of the Commission, do you intend, having identified these recommendations, the things that you, uh, are needed to be addressed, would you consider taking a bold decision by the Commission if they are not addressed to see if you wake up this hibernating European Council? And will you actually, what could be do, uh, done about uh, uh, TFTP? The, the Parliament also asked you to consider suspending TFTP. Now, uh, on the question of the judicial redress, I was really uh, struck in the U.S. in our contexts because we had very divergent views from the, in the, parli in the Congress, people saying you can't touch that. In the State Department, people telling us you can't touch that. But actually in the NSC, the National Security Council, the White House, a very different attitude. Actually, it was stated that they wanted to learn with us. They wanted to reach out at us. And the specific questions about judicial redress were not at all put off the table. So I have, as you have, the, indeed, the perception that if we speak with one voice, united, and, and if we speak at all, and the council speaks, things can, can be heard in the other side of the Atlantic, and that could be a real negotiation. But if the council continues to hibernate, nothing happens. So how do we wake up the council? Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, first, a question of a general nature. Does the Commissioner think that Mr. Snowden did a service to mankind or do you think that he broke the oath of secrecy and therefore is an ordinary criminal? Second question, what uh, Mr. Pirker already said. Isn't it a bit strange that we give almost under the all kinds of agreements unlimited data to the United States, which they can at their own uh, volition, they can uh, analyze? Why isn't it time to develop as quickly as possible some kind of a European data center in which all the, all the data that we at the moment give to any other power, be it the United States, are amalgated and at the request are given to the person that asked them? Now, Mr. Honorable Borghezio. Grazie, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. A few brief questions. Has the uh, Commission uh, obtained information from the member states most directly concerned by this, from the services of those states? Uh, certainly, uh, they have had uh, information about those. By the 12th, between the 12th of, Janu of December last year and uh, J January this year, they collected more than 55 meta million metadata tele uh, from telephones, another 4 million data per day uh, over a period uh, which is not by chance because it was the government crisis period in Italy. This is the, demonstrates the type of uh, activity that was targeted at a member state. So I think that uh, it's quite right that the Commission has opened uh, attempts at dialogue with the U.S., and I think uh, you should uh, depth on this situation because uh, in the major Italian uh, press that we've published uh, uh, photographs of the uh, superstructures uh, photographed on the, from the roof of the U.S. Embassy in Rome. Uh, 
I think that if it can reach the press like that, it could should surely can reach the European institutions. We need to uh, see uh, from this very specific data uh, what is being asked for. These are very specific uh, uh, data that are being uh, being asked for, and I want to know what more about that. Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner, you gave us a good description of ongoing developments in your view and the state of relations on the both sides of the Atlantic, the extent to which this problem is actually being viewed as one in the United States. The idea being that citizens on respective sides of the Atlantic shouldn't be subjected to entirely di different behavior. So in the light of ongoing work and the measures which have been taken, I'd like to know whether you think that these measures will be enough to restore damaged trust, or even more importantly, whether these measures will allow an, us to establish a new basis to uh, underpin the exchange of data with our friends in the United States. I just wonder whether these negotiations might not be uh, overshadowed by the enormous military and economic implications. And I wonder if the dynamics inherent in those interests might not simply push these negotiations aside. So I think that what we've just been talking about now is a mere puff of wind. What we really need is a storm to get things going in the right direction. So perhaps the Commission will take the measures which are required to generate such a storm. I think it really is important that we move towards a satisfactory uh, response to these problems. It is true uh, that we need the data protection reform because um, it, it will be our way of preserving uh, ourselves and have uh, enough force in order to uh, protect also our companies, a uh, force which we unfortunately do not uh, have today because under the American law, uh, the American services have the possibility to ask information uh, from American companies and then they prefer to be against the European laws uh, rather than um, to displease the um, Americans. And yes, it would be very important uh, that uh, we create a competitive uh, advantage in building up our own systems instead of uh, relying on the systems uh, of uh, uh, other continents. And I do believe that um, there has been a wake-up call uh, with uh, the uh, Snowden uh, revelations, and that is also my uh, response to Mr. Mulder, because um, I think it is irrelevant to, to, to have this philosophical debate about service to mankind or criminal was a wake-up call which is very useful uh, for us to go ahead. But it seems that some member states do not want to hear this wake-up call and that makes it uh, rather difficult. Mm -hmm. Data protection. If we manage to get this strongly in Europe, that will be a golden standard. And it will be a golden standard and an advantage for our companies um, because um, people have been very destabilized, citizens, and they will go for the companies which can protect them. So the first companies already go out in Europe with saying uh, that um, data is safe with, in my technology is a technology which is stocked in Europe. So it is a, a, a selling argument. Uh, we 
should go more in this um, direction, most of all uh, on the question of cloud computing. I uh, just advise you to, to have a look at our cloud computing communication. Um, we should prefer services which are based uh, in Europe. That is going to come. An American um, uh, intelligence has analyzed that on the basis of this whole question, the American cloud computing uh, um, businesses are in the next three years going to lose between 24 and 32 uh, billion uh, dollars uh, because of non uh, confidence in these systems uh, anymore. Uh, of course, Madame uh, Romero, uh, the systems are quite different, and also the perception of uh, why data protection is important. But things have started to change, and our colleagues have observed um, the same uh, way as I have uh, observed that this is changing. Now, I got during two years, and I could have signed this umbrella agreement very quickly had I just abandoned the idea of uh, uh, equal uh, treatment of European citizens and American citizens. The umbrella agreement is ready. Eh? It's only this thing which is missing. And I thought I had a mandate by the Parliament. Sine qua non. Not to sign if this uh, judicial redress is not included. And I see a lot of that's uh, nodding. That is what Parliament has asked, and that is why I didn't sign so far. It's the first time, and that is my answer also to, to Madame Lutford, it's the first time uh, that uh, our American uh, counterparts um, uh, go uh, for the possibility of changing the law. Hmm? Because before it was not possible to change the law. But when we started to speak with members of the Congress, they said they had never been asked to change the law. And that was the answer we got from members of the Congress, both of the um, Republicans and of the Democrats. And so it was not only uh, one, uh, one side. They said, well, nobody has ever asked us to change the law. And why not? It's, it's not a big thing. It's really not a big thing uh, to be done. But now the, the members uh, know that um, it, it is important for us the government knows uh, that uh, it is public, that it is important for us, and uh, we need to continue to work on this. And if I say we, I mean the parliament and the commission. I do not expect uh, a united help from the council on this, because I see how um, the Council is uh, working, on, for instance, on the data uh, protection files. So this is uh, it's rather um, disappointing, uh, I must uh, say. Uh, what is less disappointing is that, because of what I said as an answer to Mr. Pirke, probably, uh, you, you might have seen today that uh, seven major Internet firms uh, made a, spe a specific request in the United States to change the law, because they start to feel uh, the, the, the business damage with, which the distrust is uh, bringing uh, to them uh, very uh, clearly. Um, uh, on the Italian question, I can only say that uh, these are the kind of uh, problems which should be uh, taken in hand uh, by the Italian government. And um, on the SWIFT agreement, are we going to suspend it? I think you got the answer of Madame uh, Malmström. It is in her responsibility. Uh, PNR and SWIFT are not in my responsibility. Safe Harbor is in my responsibility. And as for uh, the trade agreement, it made it very clear also that uh, no, we do not want data protection to be part of the trade agreement because there is nothing to negotiate. Data protection is a fundamental right. You don't start to negotiate fundamental rights. And we do have, um, this is inscribed already in the GUTS agreement, Article 24. 14. Hmm? 14. 
14, okay. Article 14 of the GATS agreement says that there is no negotiations neither on this nor on culture. So, hands off. Huh? And um, was machen wir mit dem Lüftchen, damit er sein Sturm... So, what about this puff which we want to allow to build into a storm? This will only work if the European Parliament helps the Commission fan the flames or fan the winds of this storm. Thank you so much, Mrs. Redding. We thank you. That will be enough by now. And we move on to the second session we're having this evening, late at evening, in coincidence with the plenary. We thank you for your patience and cooperation. We wave goodbye to our Commissioner Redding. And without further ado, minding the timing, we move on to the second session, which concerns, by our invitation, Senator Arcadio Diaz Tejera, member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and rapporteur on its resolution 1954-2013 on national security and access to information. We expect Mr. Arcadio Diaz Tejera to take the podium. We would you, do, would, would you do it from there? Okay, that'll be okay. Then I suggest, I, eh? I suggest, if nobody minds, I suggest use the floor for the next maximum 10 minutes, and then we move on to a common round of questions and answers. The floor is yours. Gracias. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. First of all, I would just like to say that I was surprised that you asked the member of the Council of Europe to come to a meeting here. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised because a few days ago, uh, during a, a day on the justice systems in Europe, uh, we were talking about uh, uh, the uh, magistrates, uh, but there was no representative from the Court of uh, Justice in uh, on human rights uh, from Strasbourg, which I thought was quite surprising since we were talking about human rights. And secondly, I was surprised because you have the report uh, which was presented to the plenary of the Council of Europe, and it was uh, approved by a uh, 140 votes in favor and zero uh, to uh, oppose. It's available in French and English for anyone who wants to look at it. Uh, I have a copy of that in on paper for those of you who haven't been able to see it on the web. Uh, the Council was particularly uh, interested in participating uh, in the previous uh, debate, but given that I wasn't an um, MEP, I, I refrained from uh, commenting in the previous discussion. But I was pleased to hear what the Commissioner uh, said about uh, unacceptable, uh, because I think that's quite appropriate an appropriate expression. Uh, it's, we're talking about a very serious subject here. The question is not just uh, looking at how we act with our friends and families uh, and our, our brothers on the other side of the Atlantic. We, no one questions that anymore. Uh, what we need to stress is uh, that uh, uh, many of the uh, complaints uh, are, uh, take place, uh, in fact, between brothers in uh, the uh, in the family. I mean, there's a lot of court cases between family members, in fact. Uh, but uh, what we need to do is uh, look at things calmly and not uh, appear uh, pathetic or ridiculous. So, as you can see from the report, uh, there's 24 pages, there are 13 suggestions, and there are three sections of issues that I want to stress here. One, in terms of prevention, detection, uh, response and recovery, uh, if there are uh, situations of severe attack. Uh, secondly, called uh, culture of uh, cyber security in companies and in critical infrastructure, and what, how we can uh, look at the concept of integrated security. And thirdly, the uh, investigation and uh, persecution for uh, cyber criminals and cyber del delinquency. There are 16 projects from 16 countries, plus the Budapest Convention, plus the uh, Tajin uh, uh, Convention.
So we're not lacking legal texts. It's a question of whoever controls this technology. Uh, they don't really care about how many legal texts there are. Uh, the facts are that uh, here we're talking about electronic, massive electronic spying, which everyone has said is unacceptable, but uh, We haven't got the uh, data uh, and the pr procedures in place so that it doesn't happen again or to prevent uh, that uh, this be prevented by the strength of technology and not just uh, simply l the limits of the guarantees. Well, what the problem is, is that uh, if a child points at the moon uh, and people are scandalized uh, by saying that part of his finger is dirty, uh, I mean, we're talking about something that's so serious that millions and millions of uh, Europeans have been spied on, and the problem is whether someone has respect to his uh, uh, single contract of confidentiality. I'm more concerned by that uh, concept. I mean, uh, th that will be seen by the, the labor courts or whoever has to see that. But what's Im incredible is that no one clearly said that this is happening and is, no one seems to be bothered by the fact that the, the, we should set up the mechanism to prevent this happening again. So despite uh, Tayin and uh, Budapest and uh, the 16 strategies on cybersecurity, uh, all of this is still happening. I proposed a working line uh, for, to fight against this and increase uh, the capacity for investigating and uh, uh, combating cyber tourism. For three months, I was uh, at a, a course in the National Defense Center, and I was sent to Israel. I was talking with people who are masters of this subject, and I can tell you that when we asked whether there were any limits, technologically speaking, there are no limits. It's like an onion. You can peel off a layer and la another layer and another layer, but if you want to reach the heart of the information, you will get there. Uh, any concept of limits or guarantees in the state of law is what's at stake here. Some of them at the course, uh, they ask for authorization for the local authorities who are where the uh, servers are located to carry out this type of uh, spying. So in these three months of uh, courses with NATO and Spanish officials, uh, the final conclusion was that uh, you can uh, put up a lot of onion skins, but if this isn't uh, taken into taken seriously, you're still going to reach the heart of the information regardless, no matter what you put in the laws. So it's not just a question of our relations with our uh, brothers across the Atlantic. I mean, we all have uh, still a cordial relationship with them. That's not it. That's, But rather, we have to pick up the limits and the concept of limits and guarantees and fundamental rights throughout uh, Europe. What are the standards we have? Uh, in terms of protection of privacy. That's what's at stake here. These are new challenges and there's new risks, uh, uh, but they're all linked to old concepts uh, linked to the heart of human rights, uh, individual uh, beings. Uh, and that's what we're talking about. If we don't take this in serious, we're going to continue to play this minor role uh, on the side, uh, which is rather pathetic. I still haven't exceeded my 10 minutes, but I'll leave it for the debate, Chairman. Gracias por la presentación. Thank you for that uh, very concise and direct uh, presentation. Of questions and answers, getting started by our rapporteur, Mr. Claude Moraes. Thank you, um, and, and thank you for being here. And sorry it's sort of l late evening, Strasbourg, although you're in Strasbourg. Um, could I just kick off the debate by um, just getting into the, into the way that you did uh, in talking about legal texts and not being effective and just first of all just depart from the script and just ask you um, what you feel about the Council of Europe's um, investigation into national surveillance. You um, have had uh, something of an inquiry. You've looked at, for example, Article 52 and you've looked at um, the way the ECHR can give you um, you know, the power that the General Secretary can ask Member States questions and all sorts of different methodologies that you could have in the Council of Europe. Obviously, um, you're not going to get answers to these questions. That's the, 
the tone with which you've given us your four minutes, five minutes. So can you tell us what lessons you've learned from that that you can give to us here in our inquiry? And really to focus on what Mrs. Intervelt was talking about in the last session, which is what, what is your sense of what is happening with the member states um, and the, the problem with um, member state um, uh, intelligence agencies um, exceeding their powers or p possibly colluding and whether the Council of Europe is going to place pressure using um, its powers with the ECHR and so on to place those kinds of pressures on member states to come up with answers. Are you going to be using any of your powers to, to place any of those pressures on individual member states? That would be interesting to know. And have, have you begun to go through those processes? Um, I've read some of the resolution on national security that you put together, but are you going to go heavy on this? Um, so it'd be really interesting to know exactly how far the Council of Europe is going to go on this. I mean, I just, it's just interesting because, for example, in the CIA renditions report, I thought the Council of Europe was quite effective. Um, and it's very much how, you, how the Council of Europe decides to uh, place its emphasis. I think on the renditions issue, I think it was very effective. Um, and it would be interesting to know how you decide to play this one politically and what lessons that may have for us. Thank you, Mr. Moraes. Mr. Voss. Vielen Dank. Um, Thank you. Taking up from what uh, Claude Moraes said, I'd also be interested to know about uh, to what extent you've been addressing the question of modern technology, because this to some extent undermines the law. How do you see the Patriot Act, which provides for extratorial effect of the legislation, and in general the uh, legal, and to some extent, uh, or more or less, um, means that the legal recourse uh, agreements we have have no effect. And going beyond that, I'd ask the question of to what extent in our globalized, digitalized, networked world, We're um, being confronted with a globalized secret service, with connections being created that we ourselves can't check on. Or uh, can you show us any ways of doing that? Mrs. Sintveld. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, just. Um, uh, a short question, really, because the, the, the resolution looks, I mean, I, I suppose I could agree to every single word, but um, I wonder, I, I'd be interested to know about the, um, the, the process for adopting it, because all the parliamentarians who have supported this, in many cases, come from member states who do not apply these principles. Um, and some of those parliamentarians may actually come from government uh, from government parties. So isn't there, I mean, this is great, but I wish they would apply it back home. Um, and I won't single out any particular countries, but I, I'd like to know what the, what the debate is like um, in the Council of Europe and how um, the colleagues intend to apply this back home and make sure that their own governments adhere to these principles. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Mr. Abrecht. Thank you, Chair, and also thank you, Senator. I would like to uh, ask two questions. One is um, on the uh, work of the uh, Spanish Senate on the uh, scrutiny towards intelligence uh, cooperation in Europe. So if you... Um, had debates on the question to work together with other national parliaments or to scrutinize the cooperation between your intelligence service and other European intelligence services and the rules which apply uh, in, those, in this respect. And also 
uh, do you know about INTSEN, which is uh, existing on the European level, and do you scrutinize the work of your intelligence service there? And then one question with a different scope with regard to uh, also one thing which is, which is referenced in the re resolution 1954, uh, which is the protection of journalists um, and the question uh, in how far, for example, the Guardian journalists were um, obliged to um, hand over the material they got on these surveillance measures and uh, in how far uh, these journalists and the freedom of press is, uh, is safeguarded because obviously in the United States journalists are better protected than in the UK and in Europe obviously and uh, I would like to know how you see uh, this problem. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that report. What I'm interested in, in connection in the end with the NSA report, is the relationship between national security and what you in your resolution have referred to as public information. You know that national security tends to be a so-called killer argument. with which the information that exists is kept secret so that there's no possibility of transparency. It's a big problem if you then want to uh, address the secret service programs or whatever. So could you perhaps uh, tell us something more precise about how you and the Council of Europe agreed on this matter of national security and also Something that we're very concerned about is the oversight of um, secret services. Could you tell us about uh, how you address that? Um, how should oversight bodies be set up? In sent I've written down, but uh, my colleague already mentioned that. Any other members? If not, if that's not the case, we shall close the second session by turning back to our guest speaker, Senador Arcadio Estejera. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Well, uh, very quickly, uh, but I do apologize to the interpreter as uh, says the speaker. I'll try to uh, speak a little bit uh, more slowly this time, says the speaker. Well, let me start at the, with the last one. We've been working on this report for two years. We've listened to experts working in national intelligence in different countries from uh, different legal systems, um, continental or Anglo-Saxon, uh, current or former uh, heads of intelligence services of different countries with different uh, legal systems and cultures so that no one could come up with an excuse of uh, cultural uniqueness. Uh, secondly, we had uh, academic experts as well. Thirdly, uh, we had many NGOs working on this, and they're the principle of the uh, global uh, principles of uh, access to information and general security. All of this information is accessible. All these two years of work is available. Secondly, we stress something fundamental, and that is the general right to information. And that's only limited uh, as in an exceptional uh, manner. What limits it? The law uh, with a restrictive or extensive interpretation. Uh, sort of restrictive interpretation. Well, who interprets the law? We think that the b best is an independent authority. There are examples. For example, Spain, there's a magistrate from the Supreme Court, uh, which sometimes says yes, sometimes says no. Uh, it's a, a bad thing to say always yes or a bad thing to always say no. You have to evaluate and comment on it as specifically as possible about why yes or why no. Uh, we're four votes off fr uh, from the four signatures off from the 47 countries uh, belonging to the Council of Europe as a union of cooperation, different from the member states which of the EU, which is an integration of. Uh, 27 member states. 
we're missing four signatures uh, uh, to have everyone sign up to this. Uh, now the, on the INSEE case, I don't have any information on, on that. I, I'm sorry, I can't. As you know, there are two types of speakers, those who know everything and some of us that are human and when we don't say, know everything, we say it. We admit to, we, we don't know it. I'm sorry, I'll have to go find out about that. On uh, protection of uh, journalists, so, well, that is uh, listed specifically, as you said, in one of the 13 proposals because there is a 24-page text and then there's a resolution. That's a 19, the 1954. I remember that because that's the year I was born. Uh, so I can remember that one. Uh, and uh, there are 13 uh, comments in that. Uh, the, uh, the last question about this uh, Spanish issue, the answer is no. Well, who uh, carries this uh, case forward? The Congress in a specific committee on secrets. Th that is who is going to uh, hear the report from the, uh, national di the director of the National Intelligence uh, Authorities. Is there cooperation with other intelligence services? Yes. And sometimes there's even cooperation between the intelligence services, and that's something to think about. This is something to think about. Sometimes cooperation between intelligence services is a good thing or a bad thing and has nothing to do with governments uh, or the ideology of the parties of the who is in governments. It has to do with subjective relationships that they establish amongst themselves of passing information back and forth uh, that they've been that they've had established for uh, for many years. Now on I've noted down uh, coherence, but I've forgotten what the question was linked to that. I'm sorry about that. On the uh, global principles, I commented on that already. The debate in substance is not the spying that we've discovered now because uh, an individual has uh, broken his contract. The, the, the basic uh, debate is, should be on the cyber criminality and cyber spying. If we're talking about security in the Council of Europe. There is a doctrine uh, from a, a Spanish, uh, 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 sorry, a Swiss uh, prosecutor who was working on this free issue for years. And there are new uh, in reports that have been done since his work. And it's no longer a question of just access to information and national security, but rather the competence uh, that the state has to investigate uh, the private sphere of its citizens. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's a, a Dutch uh, expert working on this now called Peter Holmesy. Uh, uh, the speaker apologizes for the pronunciation of the surname. That's what they're working on at the moment. And lastly, you commented on about the uh, European Secret Services uh, and the possibility of us working on that. Well, uh, you here in the European Union would have to decide whether we're talking about a, a utopia or a nightmare. Uh, you'd have to uh, sort that one out. I think up till now, the role we're playing is rather a pathetic one, to be quite honest. Uh, because, uh, I mean, we approved our report by 140 votes and two against, uh, but uh, we keep saying we have to fight against terrorism, we have to fight against terrorism, uh, and everyone say, well, we all agree that we have to fight against terrorism, but we don't want to behave like uh, they are in the fight, uh, without any sort of concept of limits, without any sort of guarantees. Ignoring uh, the parliamentary uh, procedure, ignoring the state of law, ignoring human rights uh, of all of uh, humanity. Because it's not true that they've uh, spied for reasons of security and terrorism. No, I'm sorry, but when they were uh, spying on the delegation to London, they were talking about uh, commercial and trade issues. That had nothing to do with terrorism. And when the Italian colleagues said that these uh, 45 uh, million telephone data uh, of, on the period where the uh, Italian government was in crisis, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, that is not an issue of that is linked to national security. It's a question of whoever has the technological power is using it. And anyone who doesn't have this technological power, either they access the technological power or they discuss things to see whether we can work on a, a some uh, that we can try to ensure are respected. Uh, and. Uh, 
someone has got to ensure that this law is respected. It's not a question. It's not a bad thing to get it angry uh, uh, once in a while. I mean, you often get angry at your siblings or your parents or, or your or your siblings. But the the love is not gone if you get mad at them. I do apologize, uh, Chairman, for going on at uh, length. But uh, I mean, I would like all of these ideas to be to be shared. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, given the difficult subject matter, uh, it, it is coinciding with a plenary session, and uh, it's uh, not a terribly good time uh, for this members, uh, but also f for the interpreters who uh, have uh, set time uh, table. I think we were planned to stop uh, at nine. Make specific points or questions in this second session this evening. If it's not the case, then back to you. Final word. Ultima palabra, por favor, senador Tejera. Michael. Solo decirle, señor presidente, que me agra just to say that I was delighted that uh, you were the one chairing this session. Someone might think it'd be a complicity between Canary Islanders, but that's wrong. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think it's uh, like the rapporteur and the rapporteur and uh, the shadow rapporteur. Um, I mean, I don't see a uh, shadow rapporteur. No, what I wanted to say was that thank you very much for having invited me. I'm not, I'm not disappointed there's not a lot of people. I mean, that's what happens uh, in these things. But uh, what I would like to say is one thing. Quite honestly, in the Parliamentary Assembly, there are 400 members of Parliament from 47 countries. Believe me, sometimes there are rather stupid debates, but sometimes there are extremely interesting debates. It's a, a laboratory of ideas, and it would be a good idea f to use it more intensively, not just on this subject, but for many other subjects, because uh, the responsibility of an integrated union is limited to that union, but the Council of Europe is a sort of uh, laboratory uh, of, of ideas, and perhaps with greater intensity of cooperation between the Council of Europe and the European Union, uh, then you get beyond uh, the limits of the European Parliament uh, and you can come to the Council of Europe. Uh, I think if we work to together more, uh, I mean, we constantly call on people from the European Parliament. Uh, we do it uh, as a perfectly normal occurrence. Uh, sometimes you, you have to do that. Uh, thank you very much. The Libe Committee of Inquiry would like to thank uh, Senator Tejera, who accepted to come here and provide his uh, testimonial as the rapporteur uh, of the special report from the Council of Europe. I would just like to uh, react to this one request you've made, saying that the European Parliament does practice the, dialogue, uh, the institutional dialogue with the uh, national parliaments and the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, every uh, six months uh, we have been having contact. Uh, 